this talk is, uh, I call it the impact or on the impact of data caching on query execution for linked data. And as Tom already said, um, in my research, I'm interested in querying the web of linked data and understanding the, the web of linked data as if it is one huge database. And in particular, I'm working on an approach that um, we call link traversal based query execution. I introduced this approach last year, but just to remind you and to um, let uh, the new people in the room uh, know what about, I will start with the main idea of this link traversal based query execution approach before I come to uh, the main topic of this talk. So, the main idea of link traversal based query execution is to intertwine the evaluation of queries with the traversal of data links on the web. And we achieve this um, combination of link traversal and query evaluation by alternating between evaluating parts of the query and looking up URIs um, that we find in intermediate solutions from these partial evaluations. So let me show you an example. Here we have um, uh, some query, which is a basic graph pattern consisting of uh, three triple patterns. This query asks for um, the names of projects um, from, uh, from people uh, that Bob knows. So Bob knows people and these people work in projects and we want to know the names of these projects. And typically a uh, link traversal based query execution starts with an empty query local data set. So in the query engine unit, we start with an empty data set. And the first thing we do is we look up the URIs that are in the query. So in this query we have the URI for Bob. We look up this URI on the web and we retrieve a set of RDF triples and add this RDF triples to our query local data set. In the remaining talk I will call these RDF graphs or the sets of RDF triples that we retrieve by looking up a URI which identifies something. I call them descriptor objects because there are many different um, terms. There some, somebody called these named graphs, somebody called these RDF graphs. I call them descriptor objects. These are sets of RDF triples that you get when you look up a URI which identifies something. So we, by looking up the Bob URI retrieved this descriptor object, the data about Bob, and we added to our query local data set. Now, um, we begin evaluating part of the query, which can be any part. Let's say we start with this triple pattern here. And let's assume in our um, data about Bob that we retrieve by looking up the URI, we have this triple which matches our pattern, and therefore we can generate this intermediate solution. It's important to, to understand that this intermediate solution is a solution only to this triple pattern, not to the whole query. So what, what's possible now is we can look up the URI that uh, we found in this intermediate solution. This is the URI for Alice. We look up this URI, we get, in descriptor, we get a descriptor object for Alice with data about Alice. And again, we, put, we add this uh, to our query local data set. And now we can again evaluate a part of the query, which can be the same part again, but can also be another part. Let's say we evaluate this triple pattern now, and let's assume in the data that we retrieved about Alice, we find this triple which matches our pattern, therefore we can generate this intermediate solution, which is um, an intermediate solution for this pattern. But what's important here is that we found uh, this matching triple and therefore this intermediate solution only because we looked up the URI that we found in this intermediate solution before. So we, we really we traversed the web during the execution of the query. And in the intermediate solutions we find URIs that we look up to discover more data which helps us to answer other parts of the query. So we can um, do this again. We look at the URI for Alice project, we find data about Alice project and hopefully um, find uh, a matching triple that, um, uh, that, that can be used to, to generate an intermediate solution for this triple path and then in the end we can um, combine or join all these intermediate solutions uh, to generate a result for the whole query. And that's the idea of 
they traverse this query execution. So again, we evaluate the query on a local data set, which we continuously augment with data from the web. We, we find this data by looking up URIs that show up in the intermediate solutions um, of previous evaluations of parts of the query. And the main advantage of this approach is that we do not need to know all the data sources that may contribute to our query result. And that's the main difference to all the other query approaches that exist in the database community before. All these other approaches assume that we at least know um, about sources which might be relevant to answer our query. In this case, with this approach, we really we discover these sources on the flight during the query execution. And in the beginning, we do not know um, these sources. Um, and there are some limitations to this approach. One of them is that the query that we use has to contain URIs that, um, we, that, we, that we can use as a starting point for the query execution. So we, can, we, have, we have to have URIs um, from which we find some seed data. And um, this approach ignores data which is not reachable by the execution of the query. So when we execute the query, we follow the links, and um, by following the links, um, we, we discover some, some set of um, descriptor objects on the web, and these are what I call reachable descriptor objects. And all the descriptor objects which are not linked um, based on the triple patterns in the query from the query are not reachable. And we won't find them, and we cannot use them for the query execution. So, um, to illustrate this, I will show you another example. Here we have a different query. This one asks for the interests uh, of people who know Bob. So this is the other way around. In the other query, we, we are asking for people uh, that are known by Bob. And now again, we start executing the query with an empty query local data set. We look up the URIs in the query, in this case the Bob URI again. So we retrieve the descriptor object with data about Bob. And as you probably, probably remember, this uh, descriptor object contained a triple which says Bob knows Alice, but this triple does not match our pattern, which asks for people who know Bob. And that's why uh, we cannot, based on this data, we cannot uh, generate an intermediate solution for this triple pattern, therefore we cannot answer the query. Um, but remember, we executed the other query before, and during the execution of this other query, uh, we already discovered some data. So, why don't we use this data which we discovered before for the execution of this query now? So, instead of starting with an empty query local data set, we use the data that we discovered during the previous query execution. And in this data, we, all, we also have um, the descriptor object with data about Alice, which contains, which may contain a triple that says Alice knows Bob. And then based on this, um, we can generate an intermediate solution for this triple pattern, and then hopefully we can answer the, the whole query based on this approach. So the hypothesis is um, that by reusing the query local data set, and for the execution of multiple queries, which is some kind of data caching. We may benefit, on the one hand, um, query performance, because we do not have to look up these URIs over and over again. And, as the example illustrates, we may um, benefit with respect to more complete results. And in a paper I recently wrote about this, and I did a systematic analysis of this hypothesis. So this, this hypothesis may sound some kind of obvious, but there is no analysis of this. And that's what I did in the paper. Um, in particular, I um, extended the semantics of link traversal based query execution so that we um, have uh, query results based on um, data which was discovered by previous query executions. And based on this um, formal um, extension of the query approach and of the semantics, I did a conceptual analysis of what um, the impact of data caching might be. And I did an empirical evaluation based on a real-world application scenario. 
And in, in the remaining minutes of this talk, I will uh, show you some of the results of this evaluation. I think the uh, formal part uh, can be found in the paper for everybody who is interested in this stuff. Um, something uh, uh, important to mention is what is out of scope of this analysis is caching strategies like a replacement or invalidation or something. This is not part, this was not um, part of this analysis. But in the end of the talk, I still want to give you some, I still want to show you some of the ideas I have how to actually implement a data cache for the query system. But before that, I come to the um, evaluation of this uh, that I did for this analysis. And as I said, it's um, based on a real world application scenario. So um, a colleague of mine implemented uh, an application which is called Fourflatter, um, which allows you to see some information about your uh, fourth, about your social network ba uh, based on fourth profiles. So you see um, who are people who claim to know you that you did in your profile did not um, claim to know and uh, it shows you upcoming birthdays, if there were any, and it, it uh, suggests some additional properties that you may want to add to your profile. And uh, to provide this functionality, the application executes five types of queries that, for instance, ask for properties of your um, friends or that asks for um, people that say you that say that claim in their profiles to know you and um, for the experiment i used 20 different persons who publish their fourth profile using the linked data principles on the web and i, I assumed that all these 20 persons uh, use this application in a sequence one after another which gives us um, a workload of 100 queries and i used these 100 queries uh, for the experiment and what I did was um, basically three different experiments um, and I compare the first two on the, on the slides here and then uh, I compare them with the third experiment. The first two experiments um, compare the impact of caching for single queries. So the first experiment is what I call no reuse. This just means um, uh, I completely disabled um, the data cache in, in my query engine, which means for each query, uh, for the execution of each query, um, the query engine starts with an empty cache. And then when the query is executed, it clears the cache and starts again with an empty cache the next query. Then we have the reuse per query experiment. Here, I reuse the query local data set, the cache, for the execution of a single query. I execute each of the queries in our workload three times in a row without clearing the cache. And then I, I measure only the third execution and then I clear the cache for the next query. So I use the cache only for each query, but not uh, between queries. And uh, in this chart, we see the number of query results for different queries. So these are five of the 100 queries. And we see um, the orange uh, bars uh, represent uh, the number of query results in, the, in this no reuse experiment and the yellow ones are for this uh, reuse per query experiment. And what we see is um, when we, when, uh, for, for queries we get, or we, 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 yeah, for those queries for which we uh, get results, we always get the same number of results. I will explain this with this when diagram. Let's assume this gray area here uh, represents the set of descriptor objects that are directly linked from the query. So let's say the query contains UIs, we look up these UIs, we get a set of descriptor objects. That's what uh, the gray area represents. And then we start executing the query, following links during execution, and we discover um, additional uh, descriptor objects. And that's what uh, this orange area is. And all these uh, descriptor objects, which is what we can use to answer the query. And when we execute the same query again, 
So it, it, by reusing this uh, set of orange uh, descriptor objects here, and we won't be able to discover more data because um, we only have the same query and um, by the first execution, we, we already reach all the data which is reachable by the execution of this query. And when we execute the query again, we do not uh, reach more data and therefore we cannot uh, calculate more query results. But um, um, we answer the queries much faster. So this is the query execution time for each query. And notice this, this is log scale here. And what we see is in, in, in general, the time to execute queries or the query execution time for link traversal based query execution is dominated by the time to look up your eyes and to retrieve data from the web. And for, for this no reuse, no reuse experiment, we see that um, um, it takes lots of time to start from here to here, so to discover, to discover and, to, and retrieve all the data. But then, in this um, second experiment, where we already have this data in the cache, we do not have to look up all the URIs again, therefore we save time, and in the end, this time is basically um, required for the work that we have to do locally, to do the uh, triple pattern matching. Now, the second or the third experiment I did is reuse all queries experiment, which is basically I reused the data cache for the complete sequence of these 100 queries. I didn't clear it between executing the queries. Um, and here again we see um, the number of query results, and I added bars for this uh, third experiment now. I will see is that for some of the queries um, we find more results and then there are even these queries for which we did not find any results in the uh, first two experiments. Now we find at least some results here. And again I want to explain this with this Venn diagram. So we have uh, the descriptor the objects that are linked from the query, then we have those that are reachable by the execution using a an empty query local data set. And now we have a, um, we start the execution, in this case, we start the execution of the query with data that has already been discovered by previous query executions. So for instance, this query here is number uh, 61. So there were 60 different queries executed before this one in the, in the, in the experiment. And during the execution of this query, we already discovered data and we kept all this data in our data cache. And now we restart executing this query with all this data that we already discovered. And this means that um, in this data that we already discovered, we, we, we also find additional links and we can follow them during the query execution. And therefore, we can discover even more data. So we have a different uh, notion of what is reachable by the execution of the query. Now reachability also depends on the data that's already been that's already in the cache when we start executing the query. And therefore we discover more data and maybe uh, this data contains additional triples uh, which uh, may uh, yield more results for our queries. That's why for these uh, queries, we have more results in these cases. And then um, we then have the query execution time here. And now it's important more or less to compare um, the no reuse experiment with this uh, third reuse or reuse experiment. And we see that in most cases, um, reusing the query local data set for all the queries. Um, helps us to answer the queries faster. And that's because um, we have this part here of descriptor objects, which have already been, which are reachable by the current execution of the current query, but these query, these uh, descriptor objects has already been discovered before. And so we do not have to look up these UIs and discover them again. We do not have to retrieve them again. And therefore we save, uh, we, we, we uh, it, it's, it saves us time um, 
and that's why um, query execution is faster. Then we reuse the query local data set for a set of queries. But then we have this one query, and the query execution time is <laughs> higher. And that's because um, by using this data, we may uh, discover data that is, let's, this is this part here, which is data which would not be reachable by the execution of the query starting from an empty data set. And now that we discover this data, we have to retrieve it, and therefore we have more work to do. So, I have a question if that's okay. So, the, um, the reason that the blue bar is, um, is much closer to the, in, in all of these examples, yeah. is much closer to the red bar is because you've only got that sub, um, subset already retrieved because you're only on query 61. Yeah. Right. So, so for, 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 for the yellow bars, I only reach all the data that's in the orange uh, area here, mm -hmm. but I already retrieved all this data in the yellow experiment. I already retrieved all this data during the, third, during the previous execution of the same query. Yeah. Now I execute in the blue experiment, I execute each query only once, yeah. but I reuse all the data that I found from previous queries. And then um, I already have a part of this uh, orange um, uh, data, and I already discovered it before, and therefore I do not have to look up this here. But you still have to look up the, the rest of that black circle? I still have to look up this part and yeah. this part. So this part is already in the cache. Okay. Uh, this part is what would be reachable by the execution of the query starting from an empty data set. <coughs> Here's an overlap, which means um, this data is already in the cache, and you do not have to um, look up uh, yeah. these here eyes, but then um, there, are, there might be cases uh, where we discover more data, um, and then we have to look up these here eyes and retrieve it. So the remainder of that black circle, which doesn't overlap with the orange, is the stuff that's already cached but isn't relevant to the query results. It's this part? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not necessarily. Um, this, this part may contain triples um, based on which we can calculate query answers. Okay. But, um, and that's exactly what, happens, what happened in, in these cases, mostly. Um, where we get more results, and the assumption is that um, the triples that uh, uh, were, uh, from, from which we calculated these results uh, were part of the data that we already discovered in previous query executions. And then we have this last query where we really we get more results, but um, uh, the, the, the additional cost we have, to, or the additional price we have to pay us uh, to really reach the data that is not in the cache, but would also not be discoverable by the execution of the query with an empty cache. So, so what we saw, yeah? I was going to say, so presumably, the more queries you do, the slower it goes then from that point, because then the whole bit comes in the cache, and then you might discover more after that, or? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. I mean, it really depends on, on, the, on the query workload. Yeah. on uh, how uh, semantically similar the queries are. Assuming they are fairly similar, um, you will always discover, and you may discover more and more data, but um, lots of this data is already in the cache because you discovered this data during uh, the execution of previous queries. So that is exactly what, uh, what you would have in this area. So the sequence here, the the execution is very significant then. So if you ran query 61 as query 11, then so the difference between yeah. the, the yeah. different strategies would be yeah. to be different. Exactly. And um, actually, I did a fourth experiment in which I, so in, in this third experiment, I used a given order of these queries. And in the fourth experiment, I used the random, I ordered them randomly. And I did, I think, uh, 200 or 100 different runs of different orders. And then in the end, I aggregated, um, calculated the average. And the results are similar. But I even, um, for these 100 queries, uh, I got uh, a better average of additional number of query results 
and better um, query execution times than in this. But again, this differ, uh, this may be different for other queries. Mm. Is that just an artifact then? The, you know, this for that particular um, shape, that particular um, set of data and those particular queries that you're asking. That this order here just happened to be a suboptimal one versus the random. Yeah. But my assumption was that um, I mean I cannot decide in which order uh, users uh, execute queries, so I cannot I cannot as a query engine decide that you are the first to use this application and then you you come to use this application, and that this what it basically boils down to that you that you have to um, somehow predict the queries, and so the main result of this analysis is that. And first, we may find additional results by reusing the data, and uh, we, we may also benefit with respect to query performance, but there are cases in which um, uh, query performance get a bit worse. Um, but I would argue that this is the price we have to pay uh, for these additional number of query results we get. So when query performance gets, it does get worse, they guarantee that there's more results. There's no, that, that's another issue, that there's no, not a guarantee. So we may execute a query and we may have to expand uh, the, uh, the data that we have and still not find additional results. That's also possible. And the, the main issue is the analysis shows that we have all these cases, but since in the beginning we do not know what we will discover and we do not know which queries will come in, um, we cannot really decide on how to how to order these things and how to what, what to do, and that's one of the main issues in uh, when it comes to really defining or really deciding about how to build such a cache and to decide about uh, replacement or invalid uh, replacement strategies. That's an issue, um, which brings me to. The brief outlook I, I, I um, said I will give you in the end um, about how about ideas how to build such a data cache. And there are basically uh, two main requirements for such a cache, which is a replacement mechanism and um, a coherency mechanism. So cache replacement in general means at some point the cache is full and then we have to throw out, we have to remove objects from the cache. And there um, we have a replacement strategy which decides which uh, objects are being removed from the cache. Um, in the lit, there's a large amount of literature that uh, proposes different replacement strategies. And the primary goal of these strategies is, in all cases, to maximize the hit rate of, of the cache. And then additionally, we have um, the literature which proposes different uh, replacement processes. The idea here is to um, decide, we have to decide when we replace, because we, we, shouldn't, uh, repla we shouldn't start replacing when we realize that the cache is full. We should start, we should start uh, replacing uh, before, and there are different um, approaches in this area. However, the question um, that remained to me was whether studying cache replacement today is uh, still um, worth to do. And there was um, a survey in 2003 about web cache replacement strategies, and the conclusion of the survey was that web cache replacement in general, in its general form, seems to be a solved topic. And therefore, um, from a research point of view, I would argue that um, uh, studying cache replacement is, is not worth anymore. And even from an engineering point of view, I would argue that um, it's not important to spend too much time working on your cache replacement strategies because um, nowadays the memory we have for the cache is not so much a limiting factor anymore than it was um, 10 years ago. So as an example, um, the cache or yeah, the implementation of the cache in my query engine uses um, six quad indexes, so all the data is indexed six times to achieve a higher um, performance. And it's in main memory, 
the size of um, the whole cache of the whole um, data structure grows with the number of cores that I add, and I have a constant access time. No matter how big, uh, how many cores I have in this in this indexes, um, I have a constant uh, time to answer triple pattern queries over this. In the end, I have lots of hash tables in these, and therefore have constant access time, more or less. And to give you an idea of the size, um, after executing the whole reuse all queries experiment, this was the blue one on the slides. After after executing these 100 queries, the cache contained 950 different descriptor objects, and was like 750,000 triples in in these uh, descriptor objects. And uh, the data structure I used uh, where it was about 103 megabytes, which means there's plenty of, of space. Um, and that's why I would argue that available memory um, is not a limit anymore. Therefore, it's not really important to work hard on caching, cache replacement strategies for link traversal with queue execution, at least. I would argue that. Um, there, there may, it, it, it's, it's much more likely before, um, before the cache is full that lots of uh, descriptor objects that we have in the cache uh, become um, invalid and they are not fresh anymore with respect to the data and original sources. I would, I would argue this happens much earlier than before the cache is full. Which brings me to the second uh, topic, cache coherency. So, as I said, the data items or the descriptor objects in the cache may become uh, inconsistent with respect to the data and original sources. And there are different um, cache consistency, um, different types of cache consistency. Strong cache consistency means that uh, at any point in time we can guarantee that all the descriptor objects, all the data in the cache is valid and is current with respect to the data and original sources. And then we have weak cache consistency where we, can, where we cannot give such a guarantee. And we have different uh, mechanisms to achieve strap, strong cache consistency and weak cache consistency. Um, I will go over them now very briefly. Um, server validation is, an, is a mechanism I won't, I won't um, go into because the idea here is that the server invalidates the objects, so the server knows when objects become invalid and then it notifies the clients who um, have this stuff in the cache. This is something which cannot be done by HTTP and therefore I will, uh, it's out of scope of, of my work at the moment. Then we have client validation which is, um, which um, guarantees strong cache consistency. It's also called polling every time. The idea here is that whenever um, the query system um, accesses some descriptor object in the cache and the cache first verifies whether this um, object is still valid. <coughs> and um, using HTTP you can do this by a so-called conditional get. The idea here is to uh, request uh, the, the resource again from the server using the so-called if modified since header in which you define um, since when you have this, um, when, when you retrieve this um, the script object and, you are, and when, when it uh, has been changed since then, the server gives you a new version of it. Otherwise, the server answers with a, a three or four not modified uh, response. The issue is um, that um, this is not supported by most of the linked data servers. And this moment, this morning, I did an experiment because I was curious whether this is still true. This assumption, and for this experiment, <coughs> I used uh, the, the, all, all the linked data that's cataloged, that registered in this Seekend catalog, and for for all the data sets that are registered there, um, you have so-called um, example resources. And what I did is I just executed the Sparky query, uh, getting all the example resources, and then for each of them um, I tried whether uh, the server uh, supports conditional gets. And I had 155 example resources, 
And for 41 of them, the servers actually um, supported uh, condition gets, which is 26%. Um, that's nice, but um, I would argue that um, it's nothing to rely on today. It's, it's, not, it's just not enough to, to really rely on this in, in, in the query system. And therefore, client validation is, is, is something I cannot implement in, in my system. Then we have so-called time to live. This is a weak cache consistency approach. Here we have a time to live field associated with each object in the cache. And this field um, represents an estimate for the lifetime of this object. Um, to, to obtain such, an, such a, a time to live field uh, in the HTTP case, we can use the expires header field in the responses or the cache control max h um, responses from the, from the HTTP servers. And whenever such a time to live elapses, then the object becomes invalid in the cache. And then when the query system accesses such an invalid object from the cache, it has to be re-retrieved again from the original source. Or at least it has to be validated whether verified whether this object is still valid or not. And again, we can use a condition get here. And as I said, link data servers do not support this. In my experiment, I also found that these uh, response headers are supported mostly um, for 37% for, uh, of, the, of the servers or for, for the resources in the experiment. I got expires headers, and for 37.7, I got these uh, cache control max h uh, responses. So again, um, nothing to rely on at the moment. An alternative um, would be to assume a default time to live um, for each of the objects in our cache, and then do an ordinary get. So we, whenever we find um, that the time to live for something is uh, elapsed, we just do an ordinary get. And that would be an option here. So you have to say that some relationships will always be fresh. You know, so for instance, you know, I have a brother, I'm always going to have a brother. That sort of stuff obviously be cached for, you know, intervals and forever. So in, in general, um, I would say this requires semantic, semantic information. So we, we have to know that. There's, that the information about being a brother is, is, is something which never changes. And then you could do this. But the issue is that um, here I'm talking about these descriptor objects, which are sets of RDF triples. Right. And um, maybe um, your name and your brotherhood does not change, but maybe your salary or whatever. Maybe your salary is not published on the web, but, <laughs> <laughs> but some, other, some other information, another triple in this whole set uh, may change, and therefore, um, on this level of granularity I'm, spe I'm speaking about is um, it, it, the whole object may change. Right. And um, this approach here is fairly naive because I assume uh, to use a default, a common default tend to live for all the objects. And then we may have an object um, about a thing where it is obvious that uh, the data may not change that often compared to another thing. Yeah. So you seem to go through all the possibilities and just reject uh, yeah. because uh, not, uh, there is only a small percentage of uh, service providing this. But why not to have uh, uh, like a, an hybrid approach? If the service is giving you new type or modified scenes, you, you, you take so, that so if uh, it's giving you expires, you take that into account. If they don't give you any kind of information, then the best you can do is the last uh, that's, thing. That's exactly what, what I would do. So, okay. um, um, it, it, when, when I would use this, I have another um, idea, but when I would use this, I would exactly do this. Uh, when I get an expire <coughs> or, or a cache control, I use these um, as the type to list, otherwise, I use the default. Yeah. And when the ser uh, service uh, uh, supports condition get, I would try. I would use the condition yeah. get. Otherwise, yeah. I would. So this way, you have an implementation where it has to what improve as the situation of it that our yeah. service improve, but your service is the baby, and yeah. we will benefit from that. Yeah. 
So in the last, the last idea is so-called adaptive time to live. The assumption of this is that the older an object gets, the less likely it is that this object gets modified anymore. And based on this assumption, we calculate the time to live as the percentage of the age of the object. So the older an object, uh, the longer the time to live of this object. Here's an example. Let's say this percentage threshold is 10%. We have an object of age 30 days, which means uh, the time to live calculated for this is three days. You're measuring age in terms of how long you've known about it. For first of all, it's just an age, and, and um, we come to this in, in, in a second. So let's say for this object, uh, we, the last time we verified it was yesterday. This means since uh, it's time to live as three days, then we have to invalidate it in two days. And now coming to, uh, to your question, an HTTP-based implementation of this would be to calculate the age based on uh, the last modified response header we get when we uh, retrieve the resource on the server. And then the verification that we have to do can again be done by condition get. Then again, we have the issue that um, only 35%, for only 35% in the experiment, we got such a last modified response. And therefore, my uh, proposal would be to assume a last modified based on the time we first retrieve this thing. So obviously the last modified time is before that, but since we do not know, we, we take the time when we retrieve it. And then um, verification in this case is a bit more difficult when we cannot use conditional get. When we cannot use conditional get, we have to um, retrieve the data again, and then we have to compare uh, the data we retrieve to the data that we have in the cache. And when we find that uh, it has been changed, and we have to adjust the age, and we have to use the new one, otherwise um, we can keep it. Okay, that, that's uh, so much for my ideas. So to summarize, um, the main part uh, of this talk was about the systematic analysis I did of the impact of data caching in the context of my link traverse and SQL execution approach. In the paper, again, you find uh, more the theoretical and formal part of this analysis. In this talk, I presented you uh, the empirical evaluation, which was based on this application. And the main findings were that um, it's possible to get additional results, in particular for queries that are semantically similar. And the impact of perform on performance may be positive, but there are also cases in which um, the impact on performance may be negative. And this future work, I have to analyze uh, the caching strategies even more. And um, the main issue here, in my opinion, is uh, a good invalidation strategy.